for the public sphere is Jay Smooth. I'm the composer, arranger, and conductor of New York's longest running hip hop radio show, The Underground Railroad. Also a blogger at hiphopmusic.com and a video blogger at illdoctrine.com. You know, I was drawn to radio because there was a sense of intimacy there, just sitting at home listening to someone's voice that I felt like was unique compared to television and the other stuff that was out there. And I think what we have now with blogging and especially video blogging, it sort of recreates that intimacy in a different way. Um, you know, having my face inside the box there at home, it sort of has a bit of the mystique of television, but it's a more intimate, personal thing. And uh, I feel like radio, I don't think radio is going to go extinct, but certainly the role that radio plays in our lives has diminished somewhat, you know, with all the resources we have online. And I saw pretty early on, you know, I've been working in the nonprofit media world, so that false sense of security that mainstream media people had, I never had that. I always had a sense of this opportunity that I, this opportunity that I have to propagate my voice. It could disappear at any moment because when you're at a small nonprofit station, you're always going through lots of turbulence and barely surviving. So I saw pretty early on that the internet was a place where I could plant my own flag and have sort of an autonomous voice, like have have an outlet for my voice that I owned and controlled and would always be there. And I think we've seen people who work in mainstream media sort of shift over to seeing the internet that way, um, the way that I did in the late 90s. I think we see more and more people recognizing that uh, as the music industry as a whole and you know various forms of old media start falling apart and uh, becoming a lot less viable, people are seeing that the internet is a place where on a smaller scale, you know, you can plant your own flag and make sure that your voice is out there and build a more direct connection with your audience than you could before. So I've been drawn to the internet for a long time because of that, and I think web video is the place where you can do that most effectively now. Obviously, internet media is much more of a two-way experience. Um, I mean, on the radio, you can take phone calls and get a little bit of feedback. When you do print media, I used to also work for The Source and various magazines like that, you would write your review and it would go out there in the ether and you'd never really get a sense of what the response was. But when anything you do online, you have this precise measurement of exactly how many people viewed it. You see dozens or hundreds of responses if you're lucky enough to get viewed that much. You know, you get a very detailed view of what the public's response to it is and you're able to converse with them and you know, sort of build a conversation out of it that to me, I mean, to me, once I put my initial piece of conversation out there and the public adds on to it, that to me is an integral part of the piece. Like, I feel like I'm writing the first chapter of something and then the comments that come underneath it is a part of the work that we create collaboratively. So I feel like um, there's much more of a connection with your audience than you were ever able to have, certainly in radio or in print media. And I think a lot of Old media people are very intimidated by that. You see when old school journalists start blogs and things like that, they seem to be horrified <laughs> by having these comments right underneath. Or even just when newspaper sites are set up so that readers are able to comment underneath, reporters are aghast at having this sort of feedback right underneath and they have a lot of difficulty coping with that. Which I think is interesting because you hear a lot about how new media doesn't have the checks and balances through an editorial process that keeps you on point. But I think there's a similar set of checks and balances in new media that comes after you put your work out there because you're accountable to the public and because they're crowdsourcing and it's not just each individual. Any way that you were slipping, you're going to get caught slipping once you put it out there if you have a substantial audience. So I think there's a connection with the audience that's fairly different than what you were ever able to have in old media. And I think it helps you approach your expression in new ways that you wouldn't have done before. You know, I think we're looking out at a new frontier right now as far as how anyone who's trying to express themselves creatively or just deal in the realm of ideas as a journalist or a writer, how are you going to find a way to uh, survive as an artist or a creative person? I think we're all trying to figure that out. I think the Internet is going to provide ways for you to do that on a smaller scale. And, you know, what a lot of us are hoping is that the era of people seeing hip-hop as a get-rich-quick scheme is going to fall by the wayside, and people who really have a deep commitment to creating art that connects with people are going to be able to do that more than ever on a smaller scale. 
I mean, you have, I think it's the Seth Golden theory that as long as you have 2,000 loyal fans, that's enough for you to subsist as a creative person or anyone with a public voice. And I'm hoping that bit by bit, hip hop is going to recognize that that's the way you can sustain yourself. And I think, you know, a lot of, a lot of things that the younger generation is doing that we as older hip hop heads look down upon, I see signs of hope in someone like Soldier Boy, who musically, aesthetically, we hate. If you look at the model that he's established for how to direct, how to connectly direct with your audience, completely out of the mainstream, and build a lasting relationship. He's far past being a one-hit wonder now. And he's done it without any of the pretensions that major label rappers were offering to the public. He doesn't have any of that sort of gangster mythology. He's not pretending to be anything else but a regular kid who's connecting with regular kids out there through YouTube. Yeah, and, you know, he's built a franchise that doesn't show any signs of slowing down, much as we may not like the music. And I feel like that's a model that a lot of us could look towards, you know, for how to create art that, you know, I think there's no reason that this generation's public enemy can't follow that Soldier Boy model and connect with people and recreate that success. So I'm hoping that uh, people who represent hip-hop in all the various little subcultures and communities around the world where hip-hop has blossomed and bloomed, I hope we can each see, I hope we can all see how new media gives us a chance to sustain ourselves and get our stuff out there. I think any artist's responsibility is first and foremost to create good art, and I think hip-hop, I'm certainly not the first to say this, probably not the first to say this on Big Think, but Hip hop has always been held to standards that I thought were unrealistic and unfair and standards that no other modern pop music form has been held to as far as the, our lyrical contents and how much we deliver a substantive message or whether we craft our music into a comprehensive handbook for how to live your life. I mean, I don't think anyone has ever looked at blues or jazz or country or any other form. No one has ever looked at John Coltrane and said, he's failing as an artist because he didn't provide a detailed blueprint for political change in our country or a detailed blueprint for how to raise your children uh, you know, because people recognize that the value of John Coltrane's music comes in its musical expressiveness. But with hip hop, a lot of people don't recognize hip hop's musical value, so they latch on to what's easier for them to understand, which is the lyrical content and judge it strictly on that basis. So I think hip hop gets a raw deal in a lot of ways, especially because right when hip hop was beginning to be discovered by the mainstream, it was right towards the end of what people call a conscious era with groups like Public Enemy, who raised hopes very high for having this generation fill the void that had been left behind when uh, the civil rights movement ended, um, the black power era had ended due to COINTELPRO and self implosion and whatever else went on. I mean, I think people were hoping for some kind of voice to rise up, and when you had Public Enemy, and all the other groups around them speaking so compellingly, I think people got their hopes so high that they had really unrealistic expectations for how much these young musicians could really deliver as far as offering substantive social and political leadership. You know, I, and I think, I mean, I, working, working in sort of a left-wing progressive circle of nonprofit media, it's always been a struggle for me to get people to recognize that hip-hop should be recognized for its musical value first and foremost. And if we're making great music, then we did our jobs. Um, and if we're expressing something that's explicitly political or positive, that's great, but that's icing on the cake. If you don't have the foundation of great music underneath that, you know, it doesn't matter. If, if, if it was all about the message and only the message, Cornel West would be the best rapper in the world, which I'm sure he would agree he is not. The most obvious assumptions people make about how the media's representation of young black men would affect uh, our public consciousness, both as young black men as, as everyone else, and for everyone else looking at young black men. I think the, the obvious assumptions people make about how that narrow representation affects people is true. I mean, that gives young black men a very narrow sense of what their opportunities are. Um, I mean, I think you can see that all the time. Anyone who works with kids, you know, you see what they aspire to be. Um, obviously, we hope that's expanding now with certain other recent developments. Um, I do think that the rise of hip-hop is also, and 
the the standard, the example that athletes have set more recently, I think it's expanded our concept of what we can do because there's been a phenomenon of entrepreneurship both in this generation of athletes and in this generation of hip hoppers that uh, has also shown the kids that you know you don't need to be just an artist who's out there on stage and getting exploited. You can also be on top of the business end and have other franchises and enterprises and build something beyond that. And I think you know a lot of people like someone like Diddy has sort of built a reputation as an entrepreneur more than as an artist. And I think that's one of the good things that's happened as we've seen this generation of athletes and hip hoppers develop is even within that narrow window that they give to us, they've forced in a wider palette for kids to see and latch on to. Um, but I still think, you know, a lot of people in America and around the world, their impression of what a black man is and can be comes from 50 Cent. And I think 50 Cent is more complex than a lot of people give him credit for. You know, but nonetheless, he, you know, he certainly, on his records, if not in his interviews, he represents a very narrow concept of uh, hypermasculinity and so on. Um, you know, that is reductive. And, I mean, I think, I don't mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I think socially we've been connecting more and more, and hip hop has been a part of that. So, and we have so much more exposure to each other through the internet and other forms of media that I don't, I don't think anyone is as reliant on television and movies to form their entire impression of other cultures as they used to be. So I hope that you know, the reductive impact that mass media has and how they portray us is going to be lessened more and more because I think it's, it's inevitable that there's going to be a reductive representation because in order, f in order for you to take a culture and change it into a product, you have to simplify it down into something that can be branded and described in five words or less. Like it's, there, there's never going to be a complete representation of who any of us are as human beings when we're being turned into a media commodity. So I, my biggest hope, I think, is that we'll continue connecting with each other in smaller ways outside of those mass media windows and sort of get more of a sense of how much we all have in common despite those differences on the surface. I think hip hop has always had a problem with letting itself be criticized and I think that notion that you're, you're either supposed to support me or say something positive or just keep quiet and keep it to yourself, I mean I, that belief has been around in hip hop um, pretty much as long as hip hop has been around. And that's why the internet has become so scary for hip hop artists as well, because now you have bloggers and people who are independent of the media machine, who uh, you know who are expressing their views much more frankly and in much more detail than you had before. And rappers and labels are not able to control those independent voices, and you have uh, you know much harsher critiques than you had before. And I think that's been a big adjustment uh, for the hip hop world is that new level of accountability that the internet brings. And I think the concept of a player hater is one, one that people still try to enforce. I see that, you know, any, you see that all the time. Artists will describe any sort of critique as hating. You know, I always say that the true definition of a hater is someone who tries to dismiss any criticism as hating. Yeah, that, I mean, I think we need to, I think, and this is a phenomenon that goes beyond hip hop. There's always a sense that um, any sort of minority expression, you know, such as, let's say, black filmmakers, for example, there's always been a sense from many people in the black community that we need to always speak positively of the work, even if it's mediocre or not really up to snuff, because we need to support these artists, you know, and we need to support this because there's not enough of it out there. And I think that principle has been in effect for hip hop as well. But I think hip hop is established enough now that we can sort of shift and support our artists by setting high standards for them and uh, you know not pretend that everyone's turds are made of gold. I mean I think if we really love and respect our artists you know we can check them and hold them to a high standard and critique them harshly because we respect them enough and admire their work enough that we believe they can meet our high standards. I, you know, I think that's the ultimate show of respect is to criticize someone frankly and you know I think we as fans 
and commentators and artists should all kind of adjust to that, recognize that hip-hop has grown up and we could take it. Beef has always been around. Um, I mean, obviously it predates hip-hop sort of approaching your artistic expression in a competitive way has been around, you know, specifically in the black community for ages and ages with the dozens and with the sort of competitive storytelling that Zora Neale Hurston documented in Mules and Men. Um, you know, you, you can see lots of precursors in the world of music, George Clinton calling out Cool and the Gang and Earth, Wind and Fire, you know, James Brown calling out the average white band, or even, you know, the Beatles and the Stones, you know, lot, lots of people are competitive. And hip hop itself grew in the 70s out of a scene in the South Bronx that was dominated by gangs like the Savage Skulls and the Black Spades, you know, who had very real beef going on. And hip hop blossomed as sort of an outlet for them to either have an oasis from that beef when they went to Cool Herc's party, or as people like BAM, Africa Bambata, continued to develop it, they specifically shaped it into an alternative outlet for that beef and competition where, you know, starting even back in the early 60s before people were calling anything hip-hop, you know, you had those gangs in the Bronx stepping to each other with sort of ritualized dance moves, like the, the sort of top-rocking and up-rocking that was the initial um, first version of breakdancing or b-boying, you know, you saw that going back to the early 60s, according to heads that were there. And, you know, hip-hop has always been a way to sort of take that competitive spirit and pride on your block and competitiveness with the next block. Hip-hop has always been an outlet for that sort of energy. But that's always been a thread, but I think as hip-hop became contrived from the early 90s on into this forum where we need to live out this street life mythology, things got blurred to a point where people thought they had to act out that beef. You know, people got caught up in the beef and forgot that they were just doing a competitive art form and felt like they had to live it out in other forms. So the, the beef has become, the concept of beef has become something that's more toxic and uh, more perilous than it was for most of hip-hop's history. And, I, you know, I think, obviously, we had some major tragedies in hip-hop that no one knows in detail what happened with the deaths of Biggie and Pac, but certainly, you know, there was beef that led up to that ultimate ending. And I think, you know, people have sort of backed away from taking things that far. And I think beef nowadays, it's not even... The thing that's wrong with beef nowadays isn't even that there's the threat of it becoming something that leads to real violence. It's just become so sort of inane and insipid because the beef is not even about making songs anymore. Like it, beef plays out in other multimedia forms where I make a YouTube video about you, then you make a YouTube video about me where you find my grade school teacher and interview her about how I used to wet the bed. And then you go and find my ex-girlfriend and you know talk about how I was impotent. I mean, there's, 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 there's so much other TMZ style drama that goes on instead of having the beef inspire us to make great music which was what always went on even with Biggie and Pac you know the beefs that turned ugly there was always at the core we were trying to represent and show that we were the best musician but now it's sort of we're the best at creating tabloid gossip is what the beef is based on so I think you know hip-hop beef has become tiresome in that sense. I think the greatest challenge to our innovation and ingenuity has been the decreased ability to work with sample-based production, actually. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think that's the, the greatest explosion of artistic innovation to me was when sampling technology was available, but the sampling laws were not yet in place, so we had free reign to create what Prince Paul created for De La Soul, what the Bomb Squad created for Public Enemy. Uh, what the Dust Brothers created on the Beastie Boys' second album. And I think the sampling laws that came in a couple of years after that were very stifling and brought things in another direction where, you know, people are still creative in various ways and people who have a budget to be able to work with samples like Kanye or Just Blaze can continue doing that, but a lot of other people have to find alternative ways. And I think that sort of tug of war between artistic expression and protectors of intellectual property is something we're seeing, you know, in many different places in media, not just in hip-hop, but that's been one of the most dramatic places where, to me, 
the value of the art that was created by us having free reign to create whatever pastiche or montage we wanted to create. I mean, it seemed, it always seemed clear to me that we were creating something new and valuable and adhering to the same creative process that everyone has throughout the history of music, just the technology allows us to do it in a different way by manipulating the actual recordings instead of uh, working with those influences in different ways. I mean, you can go back to, go all throughout the history of music, back to the first, in Western music, the first polyphonic music was based on taking a Gregorian chant in a lower register and then singing a new Gregorian chant, singing a new melody on top of that in a higher register. So that's, you're basically, you're taking a song and then adding something new on top of it. That's the, the same creative process as hip hop. And you can see other parallels throughout music history. The only difference is that in the mid 90s, we had samplers that let us actually manipulate the recordings and do it that way instead of other ways. You know, you, you can look at jazz standards, you can look at what Led Zeppelin did with blues tracks. You know, there's parallels to that all throughout music, but people get caught up in the fact that we're using the actual recordings and see it as lazy. But if you've ever tried to make a beat as hot as what the Bomb Squad made or tried to make a beat like Just Blaze made, or even the beats that we see as really simplistic, like the beats that Diddy made, if you tried to make a beat that sounded that good, you'd find it's much harder than you think it is. And I think the amount of creativity and innovation that goes into sample-based hip-hop is very underrated. I think the Skip Gates scandal you know, was a great example of how far we are from being post-racial, obviously. Um, and I don't think being post-racial is a worthy ideal. Um, you know, I think being colorblind or being post-racial, to me, that's kind of like when people talk about secondary virginity. It's something, it's something that could never exist and it wouldn't be worth having if you were able to get it. I mean, I, I, I think we should be fully comfortable with seeing someone who's of a different ethnicity and recognizing that they are, the problem comes when we make irrational assumptions after we notice that. You know what I'm saying? I don't want, I don't think any, I don't think anyone wants, I, like, if you forget race and look at gender, I don't think most women want people to look at them and not notice whether they're a man or a woman. It's just, do you make assumptions about who they are and what they're capable of after you notice they're a woman? You know, I think our, our culture and ethnicity you know, for most of us is a big part of who we are that we take pride in. And I think, you know, I hope that we're able to become more racial <laughs> rather than becoming post-racial, you know, and be able to recognize, you know, our differences in a rational way and relish them and appreciate them and be able to talk about them frankly instead of hoping to never notice our differences or discuss them away. I mean, to me, that's being afraid of something. That's not being comfortable with it. But I think... The Skip Gates scandal was certainly a reminder that there's a lot of work to do, both in our perceptions and in how our institutions function. And I think that aspect is what, unfortunately, was lost in how the Gates scandal played out. You know, there's been, in the way that Obama has addressed race, which I think he's addressed it extremely well, the one flaw that I felt like was there is there's been so much of an emphasis on conversation and on each of us acknowledging and honoring the other person's feelings and perspectives and recognizing where those feelings come from, that we've lost track of how racism and injustice, as an, injustice and inequity also manifest in ways beyond personal feeling and personal expression and thoughts. There's also institutional inequity, institutional racism and systemic inequity. And you know those are things that can't be fixed by conversation and sharing each other's thoughts and understanding. And I think what you saw in the Skip Gates scandal, um, Skip Gates, he made errors in the way that he spoke. Obama made an error in the way that he spoke. But that Officer Crowley, he didn't make an error in how he spoke. He, he uh, abused his power to arrest somebody. And he was backed up by the institution that he represents. Yeah, that, you know, that's a very widespread problem of police abusing their power that is not something you can fix by having a conversation over a beer. There needs to be changes in how we train police officers. There need to be changes in the policies that we enforce, you know, so that, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, people spoke about Officer Crowley as if he was a rogue or a bad apple, but it seems clear to me that he wasn't a rogue. He was, he was someone who provided training on these issues and was trained in such a way that he thought it was okay 
for him to arrest somebody because he didn't like their attitude inside their own home. And you saw his institution back him up after he did that. So I think he, he wasn't being a bad apple. He was doing what he was trained to do. And we need to enact change on an institutional level to stop that from happening again, because it happens to thousands of people who don't have the connections Office that Gates has, and the consequences are not going to be a beer with the president. You know, it's going to, when it escalates, it's going to escalate to a taser or a nightstick or something worse than that. And I think that's something I wish had been focused on more. I mean, it's great for us to encourage conversation, but I wish that President Obama had also taken some time to note that there are bigger things than conversation that need to happen with this issue. I think the Skip Gates scandal you know, was a great example of how far we are from being post-racial, obviously. Um, and I don't think being post-racial is a worthy ideal. Um, you know, I think being colorblind or being post-racial, to me, that's kind of like when people talk about secondary virginity. It's something, it's something that could never exist and it wouldn't be worth having if you were able to get it. I mean, I, I, I think we should be fully comfortable with seeing someone who's of a different ethnicity and recognizing that they are, the problem comes when we make irrational assumptions after we notice that. You know what I'm saying? I don't want, I don't think any, I don't think anyone wants, I, like, if you forget race and look at gender, I don't think most women want people to look at them and not notice whether they're a man or a woman. It's just, do you make assumptions about who they are and what they're capable of after you notice they're a woman? You know, I think our, our culture and ethnicity you know, for most of us is a big part of who we are that we take pride in. And I think, you know, I hope that we're able to become more racial <laughs> rather than becoming post-racial, you know, and be able to recognize, you know, our differences in a rational way and relish them and appreciate them and be able to talk about them frankly instead of hoping to never notice our differences or discuss them away. I mean, to me, that's being afraid of something. That's not being comfortable with it. But I think... The Skip Gates scandal was certainly a reminder that there's a lot of work to do, both in our perceptions and in how our institutions function. And I think that aspect is what, unfortunately, was lost in how the Gates scandal played out. You know, there's been, in the way that Obama has addressed race, which I think he's addressed it extremely well, the one flaw that I felt like was there is there's been so much of an emphasis on conversation and on each of us acknowledging and honoring the other person's feelings and perspectives and recognizing where those feelings come from, that we've lost track of how racism and injustice, as an, uh, injustice and inequity also manifest in ways beyond personal feeling and personal expression and thoughts. There's also institutional inequity, institutional racism and systemic inequity. And, you know, those are things that can't be fixed by conversation and sharing each other's thoughts and understanding. And I think what you saw in the Skip Gates scandal, um, Skip Gates, he made errors in the way that he spoke. Obama made an error in the way that he spoke. But that Officer Crowley, he didn't make an error in how he spoke. He, he uh, abused his power to arrest somebody. And he was backed up by the institution that he represents. Yeah, that, you know, that's a very widespread problem of police abusing their power that is not something you can fix by having a conversation over a beer. There needs to be changes in how we train police officers. There need to be changes in the policies that we enforce, you know, so that, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, people spoke about Officer Crowley as if he was a rogue or a bad apple, but it seems clear to me that he wasn't a rogue. He was, he was someone who provided training on these issues and was trained in such a way that he thought it was okay for him to arrest somebody because he didn't like their attitude inside their own home. And you saw his institution back him up after he did that. So I think he, he wasn't being a bad apple. He was doing what he was trained to do. And we need to enact change on an institutional level to stop that from happening again, because it happens to thousands of people who don't have the connections Office that Gates has, and the consequences are not going to be a beer with the president. You know, it's gonna, when it escalates, it's going to escalate to a taser or a nightstick or something worse than that. And I think that's something I wish had been focused on more. I mean, it's great for us to encourage conversation, but I wish that President Obama had also taken some time to note that there are bigger things than conversation that need to happen with this issue.